All the ills of the world, from sexism and toxic masculinity to racism, white supremacy, and colonialism, they all go back to one thing, says author Jim Mason, and that one thing is mankind's unethical treatment of animals. Author Jim Mason, his book, An Unnatural Order, next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights. Brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, Jim Mason, who wrote a book on factory farms with the noted philosopher Peter Singer, then in 1993 wrote a book called An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Destruction of Nature. He says it was his revenge for what was his life as a farm boy in the Ozarks and what that did to him. There was a time when I caught an animal in a trap. My my brother, my older brother, had set a trap line for muskrats. And he had to go away to a, a farm boy conference, an FFA conference. And he wanted me to run the trap line. And I really dreaded it. I dreaded the morning I would actually find an animal in a trap. And and sure enough, one morning there was a muskrat trapped. And I could tell that it was horribly injured, that I couldn't just release it. Its guts were actually hanging out. So I knew I actually had to put it out of its misery. I had to club it to death with the the oar from the boat. And it broke my heart. (sighs) And I... Another telling part of that incident is after that was over and I went back up to the house to get ready for school, I was ashamed of myself. I didn't want to tell my family what had happened. I was ashamed to tell them that I was upset by having to kill this animal. A farm boy should do that with no remorse. But just think of it. It hurt me to kill that animal. And I felt ashamed of myself. That's what the agrarian culture was doing to me, making me do things that my instincts, that my animality, my good human animality didn't want me to do. But the farm culture said, you have to do this. Mason, who participated in PETA's virtual animal rights conference, believes what he was taught as a farm boy was a toxic masculinity, but it led to an overall toxicity of being. Mason's research shows how agrarian values evolved over many thousands of years and changed when man's relationship to nature, and especially animals, changed. Our animality changed when man believed he had dominion over the animals. And when that was realized, it gave the right to the strong to have dominion over the weak among humans. Hence, racism, sexism, colonialism. As Mason sees it, it all stems from the treatment of animals. Where animals were once thought of as mysterious and spiritual, they became domesticated and went from gods to goods. That anti-animal attitude Mason calls misothery, a coinage he explains in our conversation. Mason is out with a new revised and updated edition of An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Destruction of Nature, first published by Simon & Schuster. It all starts with that relationship to animals. Here's my conversation with author Jim Mason on The PETA Podcast. I'm not so actively involved in activism these days, although I do keep in touch with a farm animal sanctuary near here called Poplar Spring. Mm -hmm. And um, my joy is to go out there on Sunday morning and scoop pig poop. (laughs) Well, it gets you back in touch with your roots. Yeah, because uh, as you know from the story, the um, first trauma when I was about five years old, uh, involved pigs. And yeah. I sort of feel like for my uh, spiritual resurrection, I need to reconnect with pigs. Yeah. So you're out there in, uh, well, I, I lived for a long time, about 10 years in suburban Washington. So I'm glad that you've joined us here. 
So let me let me just uh, be- begin your book, An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Destruction of Nature, you wrote back in 1993. And now you've updated it, 2021. I guess you gave us warning in 1993, but now in 2021, it seems, did we take heed? Did we get it right? Or are we still, still striving? Well, I always look at the human population in the bell curve where you have one end is paying attention and doing something and the other end is uh, hateful and then denial and totally negative and everybody else is kind of in between with a mixture of awareness and concern. So we deal with those that will listen and pay heed and try to do something. And uh, I think, unfortunately, that's not quite the majority of the population. So that makes us have to work harder, I think. Yeah. And all right. So 1993, you wrote it. Now we're in 2021. Where would you say is our progress since you wrote the book in 93? I have to say that awareness is much better. I know when I wrote it and published it in 93, um, that coincided, roughly coincided with the big environmental conference that was held in uh, um, Rio de Janeiro that year in Brazil. And at that conference, there was quite a bit of discussion about climate change, and I think they called it global warming back in those days. So I do think that there's more awareness, and I understand that especially among younger generation, the awareness is much more, much more emotional, much more concerned. Um, The older people in my generation are still kind of like not paying attention or skeptical. They don't want to hear about anything negative. And a lot of them, I guess, have a complacent attitude that, oh, what the hell, I'm old and I'm going to die soon anyway. So, But the younger generation um, really sees, I think they really see and feel for what's coming. And of course, (laughs) It's already here, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's come, it's arrived, and it's only going to get worse. And I think we should talk about what's going to get worse, not only temperatures and extreme events like more fires, more hurricanes, more severe weather. Um, but with that, the second tier of results is it affect, those things affect people. Um, when when regions begin to experience some of the severe uh, consequences of climate change, the people are going to migrate. They're going to want to move around. And we're already seeing a lot of migrations. Um, some of the migrations in the American southern border, some say, are because of climate change in Central America, South America. It's not only political emigration, but it's uh, they're escaping uh, – Harsh uh, climates um, change there, and that's going to happen around the world, especially in the tropics. And um, so many of those populations are going to try to go somewhere, and uh, they're going to go to the temperate regions, which is most of Europe and North America and other places. And those migrations will be uh, a huge political and social crisis. It'll be, it may very well cause dislocations in government policy, such as we're already seeing. What we see in Europe now is a right-wing trend, a trend toward authoritarian governments. And some of the the policy discussions about that have to do with people's fear of migrations caused by climate change. So when that happens and you get authoritarian governments um, spreading and getting stronger, and of course, we have those tendencies right here in the United States. Um, we can look forward to a future with a lot of political and social conflict and competition for resources, meaning food, shelter, electricity, fresh water. We're already seeing the early warning um, signs of that. In your introduction in 93, I mean, you rewrote the introduction in 2021, but could you have imagined? 
what you're putting in the introduction in 2021 and 93, or were you no. just keeping your fingers crossed? Thinking, no, I, I and, and who could at that time, not in the nineties, could have predicted the kind of political nonsense that we're suffering from now, the Trumpism and the si denial of science. Uh, the whole thing with the pandemic and the vaccine is just a piece of the denial of climate change. We are a huge section, section, fraction of our population is is like arguably insane. That meaning that means they're out of touch with objective reality. They don't see what's going on in front of their face. So that's very scary. Yeah, scary. Yes, and so in your introduction. You're not gentle, really, are you? No, no. I, I think, I think we have to hit people in the head with a hammer to get their attention, you know. And of course, the climate is doing that for us, but it still has to be emphasized. It has to be explained why this is happening. People need to understand that there's a cause to all of this, and where there's a cause, there can be a solution. We can pinpoint the causes, overpopulation, excessive use of fossil fuels, uh, inefficient agricultural systems that pour carbon into the atmosphere. We know the causes, but we seem to lack the resolve to address them. Yes. And let's go back because you involve the animals at the root. It goes to the root cause. Uh, the title of your book is An Unnatural Order the roots of our destruction of nature and implied in the title is we did it and no mistake about it. It's, yeah. Is it mankind or is it just Americans? You're an American. You're born in America. Do we bear the brunt of it or is it really all of us? Well, the culture that I uh, analyzed is what we call the agrarian culture. That's the culture of farmers. And uh, that begins about 10 or 11,000 years ago when we began to domesticate animals. So let me tell you how I came to write the book, An Unnatural Order, how the, the central ideas of that book began to emerge in my brain. Um, it began in the early 1980s, and I had just finished had published uh, Animal Factories with Peter Singer. Mm -hmm. I had spent years looking at familiar farm animals, cattle, pigs, chickens, turkeys, the animals that are today in factory farms. And in the wake of uh, the publishing of that book, I became really fascinated with these domestic species. And I got to very curious about where did they come from? Did we always have domestic animals? How did we come to have domestic cattle and pigs and sheep and chickens and things? So I began to read up on it, and I found out that at the time, there wasn't a lot known about the mechanics or the, the, the details of domestication, how it happened. Well, in doing a lot of reading, I discovered that it probably began with hunting in the Middle East, and we can trace the domestication of the major farm animals to the area that we now know is uh, part of Turkey and, and Iraq and Syria, where uh, almost all of the major domestic animals were first domesticated. Sheep and goats in the mountains of northern Iraq. Not long after that, cattle and not far away, horses. Uh, so I begin to read up on all that. And what seems to have happened is that as that area became more crowded by forager people, that is people who lived off the land before they were farmers, they began to practice what they call selective hunting. That is a particular tribe or social group of people say that lived in the mountains would specialize in hunting these wild goats or say sheep. And over time, their hunting, uh, specialized hunting became so organized that they virtually followed the same herd uh, season after season until they became so familiar with that herd that they were almost in control of that herd. And uh, the, the most uh, likely uh, present time um, 
counterpart or example is the the San people that lived in uh, that live now in uh, Sami people that live in Norway that herd reindeers. They the reindeer are semi wild, semi domesticated. They follow their own migration patterns, but the group of people kind of live with the herd and follow the herd and sort of mildly and moderately exploit the herd for its milk, uh, milk and hides and meat and so forth. So they think that domestication of sheep and goats began that way, that these hunters began to just specialize in, our, in a specific, uh, specific herd of sheep or goats. And in centuries of this, the sheep and goats are almost under the control of the human group, the, the social group, the tribe. And um, eventually, eventually that tribe begins to confine them. Instead of following the migrations of the animals, they begin to keep them under human control. And then centuries later, perhaps a millennia later, this group, this tribe, or the, the people, the tribes of the region, learn to control the sexuality of these animals. That is, they learned to put these males with these females to get a desired result. So we have true animal husbandry, which is the control of the sex and reproduction of the animals to get an outcome like more milk, bigger horns, uh, a certain uh, color pattern in the coating. That's true domestication. And that probably isn't solidified until, oh, seven or 8,000 BC. And it happens first with sheep and goats and cattle, horses, all the animals. So this is kind of like an evolution of human traits impacting uh, their will on animals and it passing, passing down through the, the centuries as yes. a kind of learned trait that is mankind's trait. This is the way we deal. This is how we screwed up the the what you put it, the natural order, and got the unnatural order? Yes. Now, there's a very important point that is not well understood by most people. Some experts and intellectuals understand what I call the importance of animals to the human mind, and I'm talking before and after domestication, especially before domestication. It's a chapter in the book called Animals, the Most Moving Things in the World. To the pre- agricultural mind, what I call the primal culture. This is people that we used to call hunter-gatherers. Now we call them foragers because their diets were predominantly plant-based. The hunting thing has been greatly exaggerated. But the point is, animals were the most powerful thing in the world around the human, the um, pre-agricultural humans, the for forager people. And um, if you think about it, now this is, idea is not well understood, but I really really need to drive it home to people to try to imagine yourself living, say, 100 or 200,000 years ago when human culture wasn't developed. We might have had a rudimentary language, but we didn't have writing. We lived in family groups. We lived essentially outdoors. We didn't have houses and roads and television and newspapers yet. We lived in nature. We lived among animals. We would hear them and see them and sense their presence around the clock. Some of them terrified us. Some of them were amusing. They did all kinds of things that tickled the curiosity of human beings. Human beings had animals on the mind from the time the mind begins to surface in, in, um, in the early, uh, early examples of human species, not the modern human Homo sapiens, but the earlier ones, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and all of the names of the earlier human species, they had some level of human mind and imagination, even though they weren't as advanced as the modern human species. But animals were always present, and animals were impressive. Animals did things that we would recognize as familiar. Animals ate, slept, defecated, urinated, copulated, had sex, had babies, died, they bled, and human beings in, a, in the primitive times and primal times would see this similarity, familiarity with these animals, and they were hugely impressed with the other. And they didn't really imagine them as being 
quite terribly different from humans. There was almost a sense of kinship. And in some tribes, the culture believed that a particular species, like sometimes it was a hunted species, was uh, the ancestor of the tribe. Like if you take Native American people, it might have been the bison because it was the most impressive, the most powerful animal in the environment. Humans would be obsessed, fixated with that species and would ascribe all sorts of magical powers to it. Now, the best expression of this notion of the powers of animals to the human mind during its evolution of millions of years, really, is a series of books by a a famous mythologist, Joseph Campbell, and he devoted a whole section of one of his uh, big coffee table books to, the title was The Way of the Animal Powers. It's uh, before agriculture, people believed in the special significance, the special kinship, the special uh, mystery of the animal kingdom. So you have to keep that in mind, how important animals were to people on the eve of agriculture. So then you have to wonder, and this is what happened to me, when I discovered that idea and I was looking at domestication, I thought this, I thought, if animals were so powerful to that primal mind, to the forager mind, what is going to happen to them when they begin to take power over these animals that before then were powerful in themselves and impressive? Once we begin to control animals through husbandry, through domestication, controlling their movements, controlling their sex lives, they lose that mystical power. They become things. They become commodities. And I say they became demoted from gods to goods. They became just things to kill and to uh, harness for their for their physical power for livestock. And that and barnyard. And, and that change took place when the animal husbandry, the ag culture began to dominate, began to really shapes it, really shapes it. Once we, and all of this takes, it takes a few thousand years. You know, we have the beginnings of domestication 11,000 years ago in Northern Iraq, but it took several thousand years for this agrarian culture to really solidify and be kept in place before the historical period begins. So you have to imagine all that was going on in the human mind at that time. And we don't have writing yet. It's 5,000 years before we have writing that 3000 BC. But by that time, the agrarian culture and the sense of mastery over the powers of animals was already pretty well set in Western, West, let's say Western culture. Yeah. And, and you call this whole idea uh, a sense of animality. Uh, yes. And that is our relationship to animal. It describes our relationship as, as fundamental. Like you said, in the early days, early, early, early days, there was no otherness given to the right. animals. And we yet, felt kin, kinship. Yeah. And yet, animality is sort of the thing that might get us if we get that right it we might get our our sense of where our path is the path of empathy and compassion and the path the path of how to get out of where we are now um in terms of climate and and other things we can find a way out if we got the animality aspect of our lives right they recovered that primal sense of kinship with other beings when we took control of them when we took control over animals and the powers of animals and animals represented the powers of nature and all the iconography, you can see how animals are always symbols of things in nature because they're the most moving parts of the natural world. When we took control over animals, we had to demote them. We had to make them the other, but in a negative and dark and sinister aspect because they couldn't be respectful respectable anymore. They couldn't be powerful. They had to be things. If you look at the mind of a farmer, it is the animals that benefit him or her, the barnyard animals, the animals that he can use. And then there's all the other animals out there in nature, most of whom are pests, crop robbers, predators. So the farmer begins to develop a pretty negative idea about animality in the world around him or her. 
so that we get what I call misothery, which is a similar word to misogyny, which is contempt for women. Misothery is contempt for animals and nature. So Western culture in an early stage becomes imbued with separating us humans from other animals. And we begin to develop the sense of human superiority, of being special, of not being part of the animal kingdom, of separating ourselves from the, with other animals. And this is the basis of the Western worldview. The other word that comes up besides animality in your book is this idea of dominionism. And I guess that's the idea that some people are just better than others, right? Yeah. We, um, the word for it might be human supremacy, which is a belief that we're special, that we are created in the image of God, that we're not, most people don't even believe that we're animals. You are, you argue with the average person and say you're an animal. They consider it an insult. In fact, it is an insult. If you read the papers after there's been a horrendous murder, the serial killer, the savage children and murdered people, they call them animals openly in the press. You see the law enforcement refer to the rapist uh, serial killer as an animal. Only an animal would do this. No, actually, animals don't do those things. Only humans do those things. And, you know, what what got me when you talk about dominionism and you identify it, and you talk about how it, you know, it leads to this idea of supremacy, human supremacy in terms of the animals, but supremacy over other beings as well. I mean, you talk yes. about misogyny, you talk about racism and colonialism, and all of this from a, really, the, the root cause is mistreatment of animals at the very beginning. That's where it starts. Once we learn to take control, and I mean control over the lives and the bodies and the power of animals, we began to feel invincible. We began to feel very superior because bear in mind the idea that animals used to be considered very important in the development of the human mind. They were the powers. They were the first art on the walls of the caves. And once we took control over these beings that we used to respect and feel akin to, now we begin to feel extremely powerful. And and guess what? All the anthropology I read said it was the animal herds people, the various herders of the world, not just the Hebrews, but many other tribes like the Hebrews that, that domesticated animal, sheep and goats and cattle were the kinds of sociocultural groups that invented the idea of the single God. Monotheism comes from herds people. And it sounds like a far out idea, but I've read this in many, many sources in anthropology. That's where the idea of the all powerful God in the sky comes from. And what does this God do? He looks like us. He, this God is a he. He made us in his, his image. And he gave us a license to steal, essentially, and to murder and pillage and loot. He gave us the world for us to use as we see fit. This is the God that we invented. And all this, of course, uh, used or misused as justification by followers or by the people here on earth who then go on with this idea of dominionism and... It, it leads to not just dominion over animals, but dominion over weaker peoples. So you get racism, colonialism. It's all tied in there, which now suddenly you've got uh, an explanation for not just an explanation for climate change. You have an explanation for everything that's uh, that seems to be ailing uh, modern American society. Um, well, it, it stems from our domination of nature. You, you talked about the word dominion, which I use a lot in the first chapter. In the Bible, which is, you know, the basic formula for Western civilization, Western culture, the Holy Bible. It's the book for all, all three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They all have basically the same creation story. And in that creation story, God up there, Three times, three times he gives man, that's the language of the Bible, 
dominion over the earth. And in the same breath, he basically places women in a, in a uh, submissive and uh, 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 lesser status uh, to be controlled by the husband. And animals, of course, are given to us for our use. So this is the, th these are the building blocks of the Western worldview. And even if you're not religious, you have this worldview. Even the Greeks and the Romans had this worldview long before there was a written Bible. Uh, because they too, Greeks and Romans, or the other uh, roots of Western civilization, they believed in human supremacy. They believed that we were special and that we were not an animal, that we had control over the, if you read Aristotle, Aristotle wrote that everything belongs to us to use as we see fit. And uh, by the way, those cultures were both slave societies. When we marvel at the sculpture and the temples of the Greeks and the Romans, those were built by slaves. They instituted slavery into Western society so that when the 16th, 17th, 18th century come along, the Western culture of the Europeans, which conquered the Americas, slavery was already a fixture in their mind. It wasn't a bad thing. Right. So they enslaved people when they found the new world. And, and of course, none of these ideas are are gone from our 21st century uh, moment. There's still slavery uh, in, yes. in the modern day. There's still racism, certainly still colonialism. Uh, you know, we started out talking just about animals, but we, we, we've come to this whole cauldron of all the bad things in, in modern life. All the power trips. All of the power trips over the other, whether that other be a person of same-sex orientation or a person of another gender, another sex, someone who looks different from you or your people, they are an other, and they are treated as inferior. And a lot of people, you know, people are coming around to see how it is related, but a lot of people... Uh, people of color, for example, when you mentioned that uh, animal rights and it's all one with, say, anti-slavery movements and with, uh, you know, anti-racism movements and anti-colonial movements, they'll, you know, they'll get upset and they'll say, no, we're not animals. We're, yeah. we're, we're, we're yeah. you know, don't animalize me. And yes. yet they don't quite understand that uh, it's said in kinship and not out of othering. Well, that's a good point because now, of course, critical race theory is very controversial. And I haven't looked into the um, syllabus or the uh, lesson plan for teaching critical race theory, but I believe they, I, I just assume, and I need to look into this, I'm not sure they go back far enough in history to look at slavery in the West. Slavery was an institution until relatively recent times, really not just the slavery that we talk about in the rural South of the cotton based slavery and the sugar cane based slavery in Brazil and the islands. Uh, but slavery was already a fixture in Europe right. uh, when they discovered the new world. So here's the Europeans about ready to get on their boats and discover America, quote unquote, discover America. Right. Columbus, Cortez, you know, all of those guys, Pizarro, they come over to a really strange place to them, a wholly different landscape. And it has these beings in the landscape that look like humans, but they look very different and they behave very differently from what the European is used to. And there was a big debate in Europe uh, in the first decades after the encounters, they call them, after Columbus, were these beings humans? Were they subhumans or were they animals? There was one faction that just considered them animals. And there was another faction, the progressives, the liberals back in Europe said, no, no, they're subhumans. They might have a soul. So they became subjects for enslavement. And the reason African-Americans ended up being the major population of slaves is because the Native Americans died out so fast from epidemics there were hardly any Native Americans left, especially in the in the West Indies. The, the entire island populations died 
from smallpox and European diseases because it didn't have immunity. Uh, the epidemics basically destroyed, I've read in three different places, in the 90 percentile of the population of Native Americans in the first 200 years. So if you want slaves, there aren't any Native Americans left to enslave. So you start bringing Africans over because the Portuguese had already started doing this. So they began bringing Africans over in huge numbers in the 1500s and early 1600s. Yeah. And it's funny that how you mentioned the, the original, well, I guess they, I call them the original explorers, the explorers in history, Columbus, Magellan, Pizarro, Cortez. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's no different than going into outer space, right? They went to outer yes. space. They found aliens. They didn't know what they were. They yes. conquered them and made them slaves. A major prejudice that some of the explorers mentioned in their notes when they wrote back to Europe was that these people have no civilization. They have no culture. Yeah. Uh, therefore, they may not be human because, <laughs> yes, they had plenty of culture, but it was just so different from what Europeans were used to that they just considered them like animals living in the forest. Yeah. And, and speaking of animals again, like I know Cortez and Mexico and the horse, that was an important thing. Yes, uh, exactly. And once again, animals, they have, you know, come into the equation and, uh, you know, to get back to what we're talking about at the beginning, the ag idea, the, you know, when, when our animality is out of whack, then everything goes out of whack. Yeah, the, the essence of the agrarian mindset is that we can control nature. We learned to control the cultivation of wheat. We took what was a wild wheat and made it a domestic wheat. We began to learn to cultivate and to control the propagation of the wheat. We learned to plant seed. We learned to weed the field. We learned to, to control the wheat, the wheat plant. And we did the same with the sheep and goats. We learned to control their lives. And that gave us a sense of power over not only those sheep and goats, but all sheep and goats and all nature that those animals tended to represent. And, and that was what intellectuals have called the alienation from nature that we haven't be, really begun to address in the 21st century. It, it is an alienation and it's still, it's still going on now. You got GMO foods, you got, uh, I was, reading, yes. I was reading the other day where they're trying to make plastics edible. They gave a million dollars to some scientists here in the United States to make plastics edible, combining them with bacteria so that they can break down yeah. the plastics. Yeah. So we're not, lear we're not learning. We're not, we're not, or we're learning to be even better in our dominion or even better in our, our uh, non-animality. Well, the essence, the central idea of the Western culture, and that's European American culture, is that we have the power to control nature for our benefit. Mm -hmm. And we have it not only in the religious community, but especially in the scientific community. Science and technology will solve all problems. When we poison this earth, we'll just go to Mars and have a colony. Bingo. Right. Come on. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, we, we revere science on the one hand, we say, especially in the, the vaccine politics of the day, we say, yes, let's listen to the politics or let's listen to the government and let's listen to the scientists. And then yet on the other hand, science has that other side to it too, where, yes. where it can be wrong as well. So, Well, science will be applied according to the values of the people who control the science and technology. Like if we have a nature-busting, world-conquering mindset, we're going to use science and technology to do just that. Yeah. Now, if we had a, a worldview that was more in kinship and more of a bonding with the natural world and the living world, then we would apply science and technology to addressing climate change of trying to adapt our agriculture to more sustainable methods to try to quit the foolishness of trying to conquer space. We have no business conquering space. I know it's a wonderful experiment, a stunt, if you want to call it that, but it's a billion trillion dollar stunt. And that money, I mean, everyone's all crazy now because Jeff Bezos and the other guy, uh, Branson, Richard Richardson. Branson. 
Yeah. They're going, going to conquer space and as a private enterprise. I'm not impressed. Yeah. I'm not happy with that because someone asked Jeff Bezos, why did he want to send a rocket ship in outer space? And you know what he said? And I wish I could find the source for this. He said, because that's the best thing I could think of to do with my money. Oh, oh. hello. <laughs> I think if you've thought a little harder, you'd find a lot better ways to use that money. Yeah. But no, he wants to be the, put the big penis in the sky and wave it around and show everybody how powerful we are. Yeah. Well, that that's um, uh, a stunning thing happening this week, of course, that uh, we, we haven't learned, but it's, it's going to happen. But uh, to get back to this idea, animality, yeah, you know, and to get back to the root causes, we're up against it because we, uh, it's in our culture, you know, young, you know, the idea of uh, manhood uh, is tied in with dominion over the animals. And uh, you tell some very personal stories um, at the recent PETA conference. You told some, some stories when you were about when you were five years old and how that is yeah. kind of, do you, do you think about stories uh, that happened to you in fi at five, you know, as a young boy, as you do your research, does it come back? Does it hit you that, oh, that was the start for, for at least you personally? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. I, I said in that, uh, that interview uh, in the PETA session, my book, An Unnatural Order, is my revenge against the agrarian culture that made me do terrible things to animals on the farm. And the example, the story that, that, that gets everyone, and it, it always gets me when I tell it, I, I, you know, I, I choke up and I cry and, and shed tears and I'm not ashamed of that because I want to show the pain that it caused me as a five-year-old when I walked out of the back porch one day and I saw a wash tub full of bloody pig's heads. That's the first thing I noticed and it shocked me. And I looked up and there were two or three steaming pig bodies hanging from a big limb for this giant oak tree. And the shock basically caused me to black out. At that, at that moment, I don't remember anything after that. But years later, my mother told me that I became hysterical that day and was disturbing everyone because they were slaughtering pigs. It was a slaughter day. And I was upsetting everybody. So they had me go to town with her sister, my aunt. And I had to stay there for several days until I calmed down. And uh, it's telling, too, it's a, heartbreaking when I mentioned Mom says, I didn't want to come home. Uh, I didn't want to come back to the farm. Uh, and then later, years later, similar things happened. It was not just one trauma, but there were many like that. Yeah. There was a time when I caught an animal in a trap. My, my brother, my older brother had set a trap line for muskrats. And he had to go away to a a farm boy conference, an FFA conference, and he wanted me to run the trap line. And I really dreaded it. I dreaded the morning I would actually find an animal in a trap. And, and sure enough, one morning there was a muskrat trapped. And I could tell that it was horribly injured, that I couldn't just release it. Its guts were actually hanging out. So I knew I actually had to put it out of its misery. I had to club it to death with the oar from the boat. And it broke my heart. <laughs> and I, another telling part of that incident is after that was over, and I went back up to the house to get ready for school, I was ashamed of myself. I didn't want to tell my family what had happened. I was ashamed to tell them that I was upset by having to kill this animal. A farm boy should do that with no remorse. But just think of it. It hurt me to kill that animal, and I felt ashamed of myself. That's what the agrarian culture was doing to me, making me do things that my instincts, that my animality, my good human animality didn't want me to do. But the farm culture said, you have to do this. And, and you were responding as a true being of the world 
Whereas others who may have been indoctrinated by the farm culture would have just gone off and done it and not have thought twice. About yeah, it. they compartmentalize it. I compartmentalized it for many years. It wasn't until these, these incidents occurred when I was five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. Uh, about every year there was something like that. The one that Ingrid wanted me to talk about was the day I had to climb over the fence to go to the corral to castrate and dehorn the calves. And I started crying. I think I was about 10 years old when this happened. And I had an uncle was climbing over the fence with me. And he said, if you don't stop crying and act like a man, we're going to send you back to the house with the girls, meaning my mother and my aunts. He was shaming me. He was bullying me into being a good farm boy imbued with the agrarian culture, saying to us, this is necessary, we have to do this, we have to inflict this pain and this cruelty, and it's necessary, so that's the agrarian culture. So I like to say, I wrote the book as revenge against those things that the culture forced me to do that were very painful. And I say, say I buried all of this for so many years. I didn't even think about them until I was in my, probably my late 30s, early 40s. When I began to get involved with animal rights, and then I recalled and recovered the memories of these things, and it occurred to me that, yeah, I have some baggage, as they say. These are my demons. You know, I I noticed that you were uh, very emotional as you retold those stories, and I I didn't uh, mean, or I hope you did not re-traumatize. I I am, and I'm proud of it. I should. I, I feel glad that I'm traumatized by those incidents. I, I'm not ashamed of them now. I was at the time. But now I know the forces that made me do those things. And so I wrote a book to reveal those forces, to explain to people, this is, this is what it's come to. This is why we have to get out of this. This is why we have to recover our familiarity with animals, our animality, you call it give up the sense of dominion and human supremacy. These aren't helping us anymore. We need to address climate change and learn how to live on this planet in a sustainable way. And I mean, not only agriculturally sustainable, but environmentally sustainable, sustainable with the other beings that we share. You know that we've wiped out most of the major species. What is that there's more tigers in captivity than there are in their natural habitat. I mean, we've, We've destroyed so much of nature and we got to stop it. You know, Jim, uh, I, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us uh, because, um, you know, there's so much, we're all connected. You know, you know, people don't realize how connected we are and, and only by disconnecting, can we do the things that we are ashamed of or would be ashamed of if we were normal, but we desensitize ourselves to these things. And that's what comes back. And um, that's why we see ourselves in the state we're in. So I, I appreciate you just telling these stories. I, um, I, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just the analysis of all this is, is one I think that people should hear because they can see how, you know, it's connected to very basic things that we do and how our approaches are our animality or how we, how we approach animals and how that extends beyond that. So I, I guess my last question is how do we bring about kinship? How do we bring about that, that place where we want to be. And yeah. I guess it only helps if we can move toward oneness and if there's enough time. So how do we move toward oneness and is there enough time? Well, I think the animal rights people and other people who have uh, close and personal and emotional interactions with animals have started it already when we can see so much familiarity so many now you see if you have like a pet dog or a cat it's obvious that they have emotions 
Like in my own lifetime, not too many decades ago, I was being told that animals don't have feelings. They don't have emotions like we do. They don't experience jealousy, uh, um, joy, you know, uh, depression, sadness. We can see that in our animals. We need to connect with the emotionality of animals. We need to see the similarities between the feelings that we're experiencing, whether they be the positive ones or the negative ones, and at least the animals that we keep in our homes, the mammals, we know can 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 indicate those, express those feelings. Um, other animals do too, horses and cattle, and the other uh, farm animals do. But we're not familiar with reading how they express emotions. Anybody that's around a lot of horses all the time knows that horses express their feelings in body language with the way they hold their head, with the way they move their ears. You can tell what a horse, if you know a horse well, you can tell what's going through its, his or her mind by some of those movements. And cows would have the same thing, but we just haven't learned to read them. The more we can learn to read the feelings and the animals that are around us that we're familiar with, I think the more we'll begin to understand this idea of kinship, that yes, we are like them, they are like us. We are like biologically family. There's a family of humans that starts with us being apes, kin with the chimpanzees and the gibbons and the orangs and the great gorilla. These are our next of kin. And we have so many indicators of that kinship. I think it was Jane Goodall that pointed out that we have something like almost 99% of the same genetic material as a chimpanzee. We could probably interbreed, although it's a, probably a horrible thought that someone would do that, but uh, we might be interfertile, as they say. Um, there's so much familiarity that's right there for us to see and recognize and develop the sense, and I don't mean just the scientific, factual sense of kinship and familiarity. It should be felt. Yeah. When you see animals doing their thing, you should feel like when I watch the wild turkeys out in the countryside or the deer coming to graze, I want to be able to feel, oh, yes, that's animals having dinner. You know, it's enjoying the grass. I like to feel that and feel that, that similarity to my own joy of having a good meal. Yet, when people continue to place these barriers that enable them to not see these obvious things, when yes. people continue to say, well, that's not an animal. That's a steak. That's not an, you know, yeah. that, or, yes. you know, there's no face there. That's just a thing. That's food. Yes. You know, yeah. as long as we continue to do that, then uh, you'll have human beings who should know better continuing to distance themselves from their own Many animality. Will. Yeah. Most will like when someone shows a steak, all I can think of is that's the muscle tissue of a cow or a steer. Uh, it came from a certain body part of that animal. And I'm no longer able to see it as food. You know, I see it as part of the dismemberment of a living being. And I, the more I think that, it makes me sad. But that's what I'm talking about is actually feeling a kinship with the animals to have some feelings about this, even if some of them are negative. I think the barrier that you pointed to uh, the alienation that keeps us from feeling kinship is um, this concept that I use the word misothery. It's a huge barrier in our culture. Uh -oh. Animals are just like racism keeps us from seeing the similarity of their colors. It keeps us from thinking that they're like us. They're human like us. I like that term misothery. It, it's a, it's your, it's your coinage or it's a, it's a, a word that we can use. Yeah, it is. I, I looked for a word that was already in the books, so to speak, and I could, no, I could not find a word in the English language that expressed this contempt for animals in nature. The closest thing was a word that someone used called theriophobia, which actually is fear of animals, like people fear spiders and snakes and rats. Well, that's not the same. This is beyond fear. There's some fear in the idea, but it's mostly contempt and hatred and loathing, uh, like when you use it as an insult, someone is an animal. It's not a positive 
um, uh, term to call somebody that. It's it's derogatory. It's like a racist term. So misothery. We, 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 yeah, we, misothery. It comes from two Greek words. The first syllable of miso, miso is in misogyny, which is contempt for women. And uh, therio is a Greek root word for animal, T-H-E-R-I-O. So misothery. I like, I'm going to use it more. I'm going to use it more. And I say, my friend, Jim Mason told me about it. Yeah. Ms. Ms. Authory. So well, it's a useful concept because we have to have a word for things we discover, like negative attitudes about animals and nature. We need to have a word for that. When we talk about that mindset, Ms. Authory is the word that describes that mindset, just like, Misogyny describes a mindset, a mindset toward females. Right. All right. We're going to use misothery from here on. And okay. Th- thank you for, we're going to popularize that word. We're going to talk about your book uh, because it's, it's an important book uh, and, and it's the new 2021 introduction to an unnatural order, the roots of our destruction of nature uh, Jim Mason, I, I really appreciate your time that you spent with us, just sort of spelling it out, showing how it's all connected, and we shall go out there and fight misothery. Thank you for having me. It's been a wonderful discussion. Author Jim Mason, his new revised and updated edition of An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Destruction of Nature, is available now wherever books are sold. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at amok.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's at ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo. Thank you.